Well, let's get started. This is our lectionary Bible study for the Feast of Pentecost. This is year C, but it doesn't really matter because A, B, and C are all the same uh, in regard to the lectionary readings. Let me make sure we're going live here. All right. So this Sunday, we're going to begin with the lectionary of the 2019 Book of Common Prayer. For the most part, it's pretty much the same as the 1979, um, but there are a few changes here and there. And so we'll, we'll mention those as we go along. Generally speaking, uh, the changes make it a longer, uh, sometimes uh, passages are lengthened, sometimes they're given optional lengthening. Um, every now and then, something will be taken away. So for example, on this uh, Sunday, in the 79, there are two uh, available Gospels. Uh, so there's a, a, a prominent one, which is the old one from, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, the secondary one is the old one from John 14. And, uh, and then there was a new one introduced, which was basically the same as Easter 2, that one in the upper room where the famous, you know, where, where we get St. Thomas, except we don't go that far uh, on Pentecost, but it's the giving of the Holy Spirit which is why that's the new one that was put in. But this 2019 takes that one, that new one away and just goes with the old one. So it, it removes one option and uh, goes with the secondary option um, as far as the 79 book goes. Before we get into that, let's uh, digress just a minute and talk about Pentecost. Uh, what is that? Uh, it's a major feast day of the church. It's um, what's called a principal feast in the... Uh, the, the new scheme of how to um, rank feasts in the 79 prayer book and in the 2019. Um, it, it, we did away with all the old doubles and semi-doubles and um, all that kind of stuff. It's a holy day of obligation, uh, which uh, so I believe in the Roman Catholics, they would call it a solemnity. Um, but in any case, it is the highest uh, ranking of feasts. It's also one of the oldest and most prominent. So basically, in, in terms of old feasts, what you have is first, of course, Easter. And that's kind of everything. And all of the Holy Week stuff is piled into Easter. And then you have Easter and Pentecost. And you have Easter, Pentecost, and Epiphany. And you have Easter, Pentecost, Epiphany, and Christmas. And those kind of remain the main standards. And in fact, um, generally speaking, uh, a lot of people would receive communion only at select times of the year and, and tend to hit some of these major feasts. Pentecost, of course, closes out Eastertide, um, and it used to be that it was a, an octave. They basically did away with all the octaves in the 1979 prayer book, um, except maybe Easter week, but they just call it Easter week. They don't call it the octave of Easter. Um, the word octave, I'm sure, never occurs in the 79 book. It's interesting, there, there's an anecdote, I don't know if it's true, about um, the octave of Pentecost. Uh, the Roman Catholics did away, I'm not sure if they did away with all octaves with the uh, Novus Ordo Missae, the new mass, um, or just most of them. In any case, they did away with the one for Pentecost. So it used to be that Pentecost was an octave, which means basically you celebrate the feast all week long, except that there were ember days, but they were basically Pentecostal ember days. They had a very Pentecostal character. You wore red instead of um, purple, uh, as you would on other ember days. Um, and so there's an old story that um, Pope Paul VI, um, the first go around after the new missile had been introduced in 1969 in Advent. So in 1970, um, the Monday after Pentecost, yeah, of course he has a daily morning mass. He comes in to get vested and there's a green chasuble laid out for him. He's like, did I do that? <laughs> I don't know if I like that. <laughs> Too late now, you know. Who knows if that's true, but in any case. It, it, it's one of those things that really is a, a, a sad loss, and I was hoping that they uh, might uh, restore octaves in um, the 2019 book, but they don't. But if you think about it, basically, um, you can sort of compensate for it in a sense that um, 
you know, if you don't have a, a day that's a, a major feast day, um, even if you have a, a minor commemoration, you can have a votive of Pentecost instead. So basically you can kind of octavize it <laughs> as much as possible if you want to. Well, let's look at um, Pocket Catholic Dictionary and his entry on Pentecost. The feast commemorating the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and also on others. They, the apostles were not the only people there. It also takes its name from the fact that it comes about 50 days after Easter. Of course, it's reckoned um, before that 50 days after um, uh, Passover. The name was originally given to the Jewish Feast of Weeks, which fell on the 50th day after Passover when the first fruits of the corn harvest were offered to the Lord. And that comes from Deuteronomy 16, verse 9. Later on, the giving of the law to Moses was celebrated. And I don't know if there's any uh, time reference mentioned in the book of Exodus. I need to go back and look. But the reason for that is we see Passover, we leave Egypt, and we go out, and we're going to walk into the Sinai Desert to go to this mountain. Well, it takes a few, couple of weeks to get all these people out there, so... Uh, at least roughly speaking, then we have Pentecost celebrating the gift of the law at Sinai, uh, roughly 50 days after we left Egypt. In the early church, Pentecost meant the whole period from Easter to Pentecost Sunday, during which no fasting was allowed. Prayer was only made standing, and alleluias were sung more often. Uh, of course, the Pentecost um, comes from the Greek, uh, meaning 50 days. Um, also, I, I guess you could say Easter tide in the old scheme technically extended to the, uh, I don't know if you'd say Trinity Sunday or at least the eve of Trinity Sunday. Uh, so, for example, the Regina Chaley takes the place of uh, the Angelus, and so you use that, if I'm not mistaken, until the eve of Trinity Sunday. Um, I suppose that... Um, you know, it's not a matter of church regulation, but I suppose that you ought to perhaps conform it to the new scheme that where well, there is no octave. But in any case, that is the old idea of what Easter tide is. Yeah. And we should mention octave eight, and basically an, a, a week long plus one. So an octave is is you go the whole week and you come around to where you started. Uh, so that's why it's not a seven-day or sep septive. I don't know. It has um, in the in the 79 book and in the 19 or 2019 book there are two collects uh, for this day. The old one uh, we'll read first, and then we'll read the new one. Um, now the old one in both uh, 79 and 2019 is the second option. So the the newer one is the preferred, um, but you know, anyone can be chosen. And generally speaking, I, I kind of do the first one um, for the, the Sunday, and if there's a second one, then I use that one as a supplement, you know, on other days after that when you resume the Sunday Mass. So the old one goes like this. Let us pray. O God, who is at this time to teach the heart of thy faithful people by sending the, to them the light of thy Holy Spirit, Grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort, through the merits of Christ Jesus our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. So there you, you have a mention of the giving of the Holy Spirit, and you also have a mention of the Holy Spirit's name, the Paraclete, which comes from John's Gospel. Um, in fact, I wonder, is that... Does that come up in the gospel for, yes, it does, the comforter. Uh, so it, it's a nice tie-in, um, evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. The comforter comes with his gifts, and of course, it would make sense that one of the gifts of the comforter would be his comfort. But it's not just about, you know, helping us feel better or cheering us up or something like that. Uh, remember, parakletos is um, difficult to translate. Um, it's been translated as comforter, but also as advocate, guide, 
And it means basically to stand alongside, um, much like you know your defense attorney would stand alongside you through your trial and, and get you through that. So it's something that emboldens us. The Holy Spirit comes to uh, strengthen us, guide us, walk through life with us, live on the inside of us. Uh, there's so many ways where it kind of uh, fits. And it's a wonderful title. It's just uh, too bad that there's just not really a, a good English equivalent. Um, maybe we ought to just get in the habit of saying paraclete and make it our own. Now the other collect is much more evangelistic, um, much more in the, the idea of the mission of the church to expand throughout the world. And uh, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, um, I want you to go back to the city and wait and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, then what? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, all the ends of the earth. And so it focuses on that kind of evangelistic um, output and tone. I don't know <clears throat> for sure the origin of this one. Uh, I looked in my old book during the drafting of the 79 prayer book, and it has uh, not this collect, but one that sounds very similar. And it was attributed to a new composition for the Church of South India uh, from, I think, the 1950s. So I don't know if they, if they just wrote a new one from scratch here or if they took that one and kind of tweaked it a little bit and polished it up, because it is very similar, but it's not the same. So I'm not quite sure. But in any case, we do know that it's uh, a relatively speaking new collect. But it's also a very nice one. It goes like this. Let us pray. Almighty God, who on this day didst open the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of thy Holy Spirit, shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. And uh, there's some things definitely to like very much about this collect. First of all, it, it seems to be written specifically for Pentecost. So it, it, it lends itself less to being used on other occasions, even resuming the Sunday on the weekdays that follow, because it mentions on this day. Uh, rather than just at this, around this time or something like that. And interestingly, in the, in the book, it doesn't put that into brackets. So some, some, sometimes when you get a time-specific mention like that, it'll, it'll set it off into brackets to say, you know, if you're going to use this at some other time, you can kind of leave that part out. But it emphasizes a, a specific day, a specific time. On this day, uh, you opened the way of eternal life and you opened it to everyone. And of course, um, the inclusion of the Gentiles is a big story in the book of Acts and a big story in the spread of the gospel and the building of the church and uh, Paul's interaction in his letters to the churches about how to navigate and deal with some of these things that are new and you know how do we handle it. And so it emphasizes the universal appeal, the universal mission of the gospel to every race and nation. And we see that promise fulfilled in John's revelation at the end of the Bible. When at, 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 the, at the judgment day in the new creation, what did I see? I saw gathered around the throne and the lamb, myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands from every tribe and nation and tongue and people, all gathered around Christ worshiping the lamb. And it's also, I love that uh, this collect has that detail. Um, so it's open, it, it opens the way to every race and nation but how does it do that? It says, it's shed abroad. This gift is shed abroad throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel. And that's a little bit of a reminder that um, Joel in his prophecy said that the spirit would be poured out on all flesh. But it's not a direct thing. It's a mediated thing. Um, Father um, uh, John Haidt uh, loved to point out that um, the modern church uh, has things kind of reversed from the biblical teaching. In the modern church, you often hear the Holy Spirit is given to the world. You know, we need to listen to the world and see what the Spirit is saying out there, outside the church. Uh, and then Jesus is, is for us, you know. Uh, Jesus is our way of salvation, you know, our, our guide. We listen to Jesus, we follow Jesus, but the Spirit is everywhere. 
Well, that's exactly the reverse of the Bible. What you find in the Bible is Jesus is given to the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and so on. But the spirit is given to the church and through the church to the world. And that's what we find reflected here. Shed abroad this gift through the, through the preaching of the gospel that it may reach to the ends of the earth. And of course, we're asking for God to help us fulfill his own commission and promise when he said, I want you to go into the, all the world and be my witnesses. And wherever you take Jesus, you take the spirit. And the um, sort of the sign that people have received Jesus is that they receive the spirit. And that's what we see um, basically every time you, 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 the, the gospel crosses over into a new people group, you see this sort of rippling effect of the uh, evidences at Pentecost, uh, prophesying and preaching in tongues and miracles and so forth to kind of authenticate and let us know that yes, this, these outsiders are now insiders. They too have received the gift of the spirit and been incorporated into Christ. Well, let's get into the readings. Um, <clears throat> of course, throughout uh, Easter, um, the, th the three reading scheme is a little bit altered where we get um, Acts kind of used as like an Old Testament history book. So Acts comes first, and then we get a regular epistle and the, and the gospel. And then um, there are alt alt alternative arrangements if you're a morning prayer parish or if you just want to keep the old pattern, uh, well, old pattern um, of an Old Testament reading first and then Acts as the New Testament reading. And that holds true also for um, this one here. Uh, so in some sense, we might say that uh, uh, Pentecost is, is sort of treated uh, as it were part of uh, Easter uh, in terms of the arrangement of the readings. So the Old Testament that you can use if you want to, you don't have to, um, is Genesis 11, 1 through 9. I'll just look back and double check. Yeah, so that's what I thought, is that, um, because if you think about it, what is Pentecost in terms of the big schema of the story of the Bible? It's the reversal of the Tower of Babel story. So at Babel, you have people who are basically <clears throat> wanting to worship themselves, uh, reach up to heaven, and God uh, gives them the smackdown. And how does he give them the smackdown? He comes and confuses their language. So confusion is something that hinders us and uh, holds us back. Communication is something that helps us go forward. So we see the reverse of Babel at Pentecost. What happens? Um, people, God's people are humbly waiting. Uh, so they're not building their tower, exalting themselves. They're humbly waiting in a vigil of prayer and God comes down and gives the gift of his spirit and the gift of communication and understanding. So now they're able to speak in various tongues and there's no hindrance and they can move forward with the spread of the gospel and the building up of the kingdom. The building up of the kingdom, you might say, that does reach up to heaven and participate in the life of heaven. So a lot of intriguing kind of connections and cross-references going on uh, all throughout Pentecost. So if you wanted to do the Old Testament, that is the Old Testament reading, the Tower of Babel story, Genesis 11, 1 through 9. But we'll stick with the uh, uh, Easter pattern of having Acts first. And um, in, let's see, what is the, the Roman Catholic lection is the same as the 79 prayer book lection, which is also, I think, the same uh, yeah, as the old prayer books, which is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The 2019 book has that, but it also adds some optional verses to extend it if you want to. So it goes on to Peter's first sermon. Uh, so we'll look at that as well uh, after we look at Acts uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, which is the, the base story. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven, like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each one of them. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our tongues the mighty works of God. So let's go on and look at the uh, optional extension uh, after that, verses 12 through 21. So they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But some sneered and said, They are drunk on new wine. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, Let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And this is uh, Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 28. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy and will display wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Therefore, the great and glorious day, sorry, the moon will be turned to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And, of course, um, the final line, there's a great emphasis on that universal call and appeal of the gospel. And this is even before Peter has had his own experience that comes a little later of um, his vision. um, of Rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, I've never had anything unclean. No, 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 I want you to do this. This is a different situation now. And, in fact, I want you to get up and go down to Cornelius' house. He's a Gentile, but I'm bringing him into the church, and I want you to baptize him and so on. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, in Peter's first sermon, he's prophesying, and in a sense, he's prophesying to himself. And the Holy Spirit is saying, um, I'm fulfilling now what I spoke way back in the prophet Joel. And, uh, you, you know, you haven't even realized the full implications of this yet, but you are going to see it unfold right in front of your eyes. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh through the preaching of the gospel. And as we cross these hurdles of uh, uh, race and nationality and uh, men and women and so on, uh, you'll see the manifestations of the Spirit, uh, like they'll prophesy and so on. I wonder if there's any commentary from Joel on this part. St. Cyril of Jerusalem says on this section that's quoted by uh, Peter, and it seems to me I haven't done any research into this, but just kind of looking at uh, the text, because this text will have bold wherever it's a direct quote and not bold wherever it, you know, adds something new or diverges in some way. And this is one of the, seems like the most direct uh, quotes from the Old Testament, because sometimes it'll be kind of paraphrased. So St. Cyril of Jerusalem says, commenting on um, this excerpt from Joel, If you would receive a testimony also, listen, he says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass after this, says God, I will pour forth of my spirit. And this word, I will pour forth, implied a rich gift, for God gives not the spirit by measure, for the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand, that's John 3.34. And he has given him the power also of bestowing the grace of the all-holy spirit on whomever he will. I will pour forth of my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And afterward, yea, and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So I, I think the, the point there is also the, um, the universal call of the gospel and the gift of the spirit also transcends the distinction of class. So we have nation, race, uh, male and female, and class, and, and any other division we can think of. The Holy Spirit is no respecter of persons, for he seeks not dignities, but piety of soul. Let neither the rich be puffed up, nor the poor be dejected, but only let each prepare himself for reception of the heavenly gift. This is from his catechetical lectures, where he instructs um, the newly baptized. All right, let's see. Let's go back and look at... Um, some of the details in the main reading, because um, the, uh, the excerpt from um, Peter's sermon, uh, the, the, the bulk of it is just that quote from Joel. I, I don't know exactly what to make, and I forget if I have heard an explanation. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. I don't know what that means. I don't know. That's obviously a very um, symbolic uh, type of reference. Um, I, I think it is in, indicative of great change uh, because uh, uh, just like the d destruction of the temple and the descriptions of that as basically the, the creation falling apart um, because the temple was built as kind of a microcosm of creation. The temple falls, the, the, the cosmos falls. So I think here th these are signs of, of great cosmic change, you know, the new creation is beginning. Uh, but before that happens, and before Judgment Day, the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh, all over the world. Not just in Israel, but all over the world. Well, there are two kinds of eclipses, one of which was yeah. trying to turn the, turn the sun black, but there's other ones that turn the moon red. Yeah, so a, a, a lunar eclipse, um, also depending on the angle and where you are, um, uh, I think it's if, if it's kind of a a, a partial eclipse um, where you get uh, not a full shade but sort of kind of on the edge it'll make it'll give the moon kind of this reddish orangish uh, tint so yeah that's that's a good point about the moon be be turned to blood the sun turned to darkness a solar eclipse and the moon turned to blood a lunar eclipse uh, there'll be signs on earth as well blood and fire and cloud of smoke I'll display wonders in the heavens and so on also, it's, it's interesting, um, and I'm sure, not, not exactly sure what to make of it, uh, if there's any um, real theological uh, implication here, but uh, this whole thing about uh, drunkenness. No, 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 they're, they're not drunk. They're drunk on the spirit, as it were. Um, and so there's, it's interesting that uh, they s people see this ecstatic enthusiasm and people speaking and languages they don't recognize, people saying prophetic utterances, and they think they must be intoxicated. It's like, no, 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 no. These are signs of the Holy Spirit. And I think it perhaps speaks to a little bit to uh, the perception of the wonders of God by those who are inside and outside the church. That those inside things make sense to outside. They don't make sense. Very similar to what St. Paul talked about, you know, the wisdom of God looks like foolishness to the world. Um, so perhaps that might be the, the theological implication of that. Well, let's look at um, the, the main reading, verses 1 through 11. Um, first of all, they are still in their vigil. The, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Tradition tells us that this is the upper room, the, the cynical, the same place, um, where they had had the Last Supper. But this time, there's a much larger group there. Uh, earlier in the book of Acts, we get, it, we get a number. There's about 120. So there's not just the 11 apostles, but there's all these kinds of people gathered together. Um, there's no mention of Mary, but she's always depicted in paintings of Pentecost and things like that as being there. Um, and it certainly would make sense. Where else would she be but gathered with the rest of the church in prayer? And 
Also, this idea of the, um, the tongues of fire appearing above them, um, that ends up being kind of a symbol of apostles. Um, uh, but it's something that seems to happen to everybody. It doesn't seem to be a distinction here. Just everyone on whom the Spirit falls looks like a lighted candle. And I wonder if perhaps that is meant to be the idea. And it's curious because the, the liturgical ritual doesn't come until later. I, I'm not aware of any um, Jewish connection with, you know, lamps lighted, put out, relighted, in terms of the celebration of Pentecost, um, which is the, also called the Feast of Weeks. Um, there could be, but I don't know that there is. But in any case, it, it, it's very much like um, what we see in church with the Paschal candles. And the Paschal candle represents the risen Christ, the light of the world. And then the candle is put out on ascension when he goes, and then we're waiting for God to come back to us. And when he comes back to us, he doesn't come back as the, the candle, because that's Christ, but he comes back in us, in the presence of the Spirit. And then we become the candle. So we're lighted. we got this flame above our heads. So you know, we, we, come, we become human candles. Um, so I wonder if there's any you know, old Jewish liturgical ritual connection in terms of like lamps lighted that might um, relate to this. Or you, you think maybe for a, for a wedding, the, re, you know, the coming of the bridegroom? I don't know. It's, it's intriguing to think about. And, and also, the, of course, there's other Old Testament connections with the idea of fire and God's presence. Uh, so in Hebrews, we get a reference to God is our, our God is a consuming fire. Um, and of course, the burning bush. Uh, God appears and speaks to Moses, um, speaking from the midst of the fire. Um, and then all throughout um, the experience of the Exodus, you know, from the top of Mount Sinai, it's blazing with fire up there. Um, they put the, the Ten Commandments in the, in the ark. And the ark is like God's throne on earth, and he leads them through the wilderness. Um, and in, all day long, there's this pillar of cloud going up, as it were, from a big bonfire. And then at night, there's this glow of flame that they see that's leading them forth. Or, you know, whenever, whenever it moves, they move. Whenever it stays, they stay. Um, and also the, the, uh, the angels. You know, the angels are organized into different, we call them choirs, different types of angels and it, it seems like there's this kind of concentric circles radiating out from God's presence um, and who are the ones who are closest to God on in the, in the inner circle who are right next to him whose only job is just to surround him with worship they are named the seraphim seraph means fire so it's like they're so close to God are consuming fire that they are fire you know only fire can get that close to fire as it were so there's a lot of fire language in terms of the manifestation of God's presence. So it certainly makes sense that when God comes down um, to uh, dwell with his people, uh, we get this fire imagery that clues us in that, yes, God is there. He has arrived. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That The fire wasn't the only thing. Um, and we also should make a reference that um, in the Western church, not in the Eastern church, in the Eastern church, mitres are like, Crowns. So they're very much kind of a Byzantine imperial court type of symbolism. In, in the Old Testament, you also get mention of mitres, but it's not like what you think of in church. It's uh, basically more like a turban. So think, uh, you know, a, a Middle Eastern sheik with his turban on his head. That is the mitre of the Old Testament. But the mitre of the New Testament um, is you know, that pointy hat. What does that pointy hat mean? Where does it come from? It comes from this. It's the flame of fire over the head of the bishop. Now, why did that stick with the bishop? Why, do we all, why don't we all wear mitres, uh, at least on Pentecost? Um, well, I think it'd be, it, it, it's a reminder that the Holy Spirit dwells in the bishop, so he is the one who imparts and passes on the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he comes around, you know, for confirmation and for ordination and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so it's like a visible reminder that he has the Spirit so he can 
impart the spirit to others and pass it on. So not only the fire is a visible reminder of uh, the spirit's presence, but also they began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. So not only is there this miracle of speaking in other languages, presumably that they don't know, but also that God is communicating through them. So they're not just, you know, going out and talking about baseball in languages they don't know. You know, they're communicating what God wants to say in languages they don't know. I wanted to read, um, there's this wonderful um, early church reading. Um, it's a, an anonymous uh, work. Unfortunately, we don't know who to attribute it to. We know it comes from Africa, somewhere in Northern Africa, uh, around the sixth century. But it's this uh, sermon or a commentary or something on uh, Acts. It goes like this. They spoke in every tongue. It was God's will to demonstrate the presence of the Holy Spirit at that moment by enabling those who had received him to speak in every tongue. For you must understand, my dear brethren, that it is through the Holy Spirit that love is poured out in our hearts. Now the love of God was to gather together the church all over the world. Consequently, while a single man, if he received the Holy Spirit, could speak in every tongue, now the one church in its unity which is established by the Holy Spirit, speaks in every tongue. And so if anyone says to one of us, you have received the Holy Spirit, why do you not speak in tongues? He should reply, I do speak in every tongue, for I am the body of Christ, the church, which speaks in every tongue. For what did God signify by the presence of the Holy Spirit if it was not that his church would speak in every tongue? So this is a very interesting take. Uh, that's from the 6th century. So this is uh, long after uh, speaking in tongues had died out as a normative thing. We do have record of it continuing on sporadically uh, in isolated cases. So you'll have stories about um, particular saints, um, particularly um, evangelists and um, people like that, who uh, people who didn't know, you know, maybe was speaking Latin and they didn't know Latin or whatever, but they were able to hear it in their own native um, Eastern European language or something, uh, or Greek or wherever they came from. So we do have records of that continuing on. Also, one more thing to point out about uh, speaking in these unknown languages is that there's, there seems to be, it's, refer, it's referred to as speaking in tongues, but it seems like there's kind of a two-fold and two-sided gift because you think about especially this new wine thing, you know, it's like, are these people drunk? You know, they're just kind of babbling incoherently. So to the outsider who is not ready and poised to receive the Holy Spirit, it just sounds like a bunch of nonsense, perhaps. Whereas to those who are ready, to, heart, to those whose hearts are prepared, what do they hear? They hear them speaking in their own native language. They hear God speaking directly to them through the church. And it's unique to that person. So it seems to me like there's kind of two parallel miracles or, or parts of the same miracle, the speaking in tongues and also the gift of understanding. And, of course, understanding is one of the uh, sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's this wonderful detail in verse uh, 10. Um, so it's not just different languages, but it's even different dialects. So it's, you know, very unique to the person. Uh, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, not just anywhere in Libya, but, you know, that unique dialect of those people who are Cyrenians. You know, I, he I don't just hear God speaking, but I hear God speaking, and he sounds like he was born in Louisiana, you know. <laughs> and that may be something about a word of discernment um, when you're trying to figure out what God might be saying to you, communicating to you, leading you to do. Um, does it feel natural? Does it feel like it fits? Does it feel like it, it's for me? Um, of course, all of that is, is subjective, subjective, and there's a lot of uh, different things that we need to do to have sort of safeguards in terms of discernment. Uh, but, but that's one bit of it, is that it seems to fit me. It's a message for me. Well, let's go ahead and look at the psalm. Um, the 79 prayer book has a number of different arrangements for the psalm and the 
2019 prayer book tightens that up a little bit. So it doesn't have one of these shorter um, excerpts for Psalm 104. Uh, what we get is a larger one. So, um, for example, in the 79 prayer book, the shortest option you've got is verses 24 to 31. Whereas in the 2019, the shortest option you got is verses 24 to 37. So we get a few more extra verses. So we'll look at that. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works, and wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy creatures. Yonder is the great, is the, sorry, yonder is the sea, great and wide, with which teems with things innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships, and the Leviathan, which thou didst form to the sport of it, to sport in it. These all look to thee, to give them their food in due season. When thou givest to them, they gather it up. When thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good things. When thou hidest thy face, they are dismayed. When thou turnest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the ground. May the, Lord, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. This uh, Psalm 104 is, a, is a, a, a praise psalm. It's not attributed to anyone, so it's not like a psalm of David. Um, but it, it focuses a lot on creation and thanksgiving and praise of God for creation and the works of creation. It begins here in our excerpt, beginning in verse 24, with um, the various creatures, man, of course, and all the, the sea creatures. Um, interestingly, that it seems to kind of focus on the sea. I don't see any mention of birds or land. Um, but at least in this section, I, it, it may have gone through others before that. Yeah, it does mention um, in the other verses before that different uh, other parts of creation it talks about the livestock and it talks about the uh, the seed to grow in the ground and so on. So it's generally speaking uh, a, a Thanksgiving psalm, and it might even go back to uh, to Jewish practice because um, this is the festival of weeks where we gather in the first cutting of the harvest to give thanks to God, and basically all the old festivals are related to seed time and harvest. Um, and then they also take on symbolic uh, spiritual significance as well. Verse 31 um, is kind of the key uh, where the old shortest selection ended. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So this idea that God is continually providing for his creation, nourishing his creation, making it fruitful, and that all depends upon the gift of God's grace in pouring forth his spirit, maintaining his creation in good order, and so on. Which we could spiritualize in terms of our own inner life by saying, you know, the, the seeds of the gospel of the words of God take root in my life, and they bring forth fruit of good works, and so on, um, when I rely upon God to continually pour out his fresh grace on me and uh, give me sunshine and, and rain, as it were, and uh, bring forth fruits of the Spirit within me. Well, let's look at the epistle. Uh, one more. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Well, it does kind of relate to, I mean, the previous verse, even though it doesn't use the word the righteous or something like that, um, it, it does talk about the righteous, so it is making a contrast. And the, the style of Hebrew poetry, well it, well, it could be too, but remember the style of Hebrew poetry is to lay forth parallels and contrasts. 
So consider the verse in front of that. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. What's the opposite? Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Well, it's not always going to be directly opposite, but it's, it's you know. Um, True, but I think that's your answer of why is that there, how does it fit in? It's fit in to be a contrast with what comes right in front of that. Well, let's look. And we should also note that that concludes the end of that psalm. So, yeah. we, so we pick up midstream, but we go to the end in verse 37. Let's look at the epistle, which is from 1 Corinthians. Of course, uh, in the Corinthian church, there was, um, what you call it, an outbreak of uh, uh, spiritual gifts and especially uh, a fascination and controversy over speaking in tongues. And um, so it created problems. It created uh, jealousies and rivalries and uh, confusion. Um, so God had blessed them, uh, but Paul has to kind of address some of these situations. And I believe uh, chapters uh, 12, 13, and 14 um, all basically um, give his uh, admonition about dealing with spiritual gifts and what they're all about and how these more exotic things like speaking in tongues fits in with the overall program. See, just turn into uh, Father uh, Fuller to see if I've left out any crucial points there. Uh, he mentions um, in, in, in replying to their challenges, uh, Paul indicates several things. First, he says to have the Spirit means to confess that Jesus is Lord. So he kind of goes back to the main thing. What is the main thing? Jesus is the main thing. And Jesus had talked about that in John's Gospel. You know, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. What kinds of things is he going to do? He's going to be with you just like I've been with you. I've been your paraclete. Now he's going to be your paraclete. He's going to bring to your mind things that I've said. He's going to unite me to me just like I'm united to the Father. So there's a lot of things that, that, um, where the Holy Spirit ties us into Jesus. So that's the main thing that Paul says. To have the Spirit means that you have Jesus. It means that you confess that Jesus is Lord. And then he says, um, the gifts of the Spirit take different forms, not just the most flashy, exotic one like speaking in tongues. So you have to keep things in their proper perspective. Don't get uh, distracted by only one facet of this thing. And then third, he says, the gift of the Spirit must not lead to individualism, but to the building up of the corporate body of the community. So these gifts are not really for you. They are for other people and for God to minister to other people through you. So just like in that opening collect, we talked about how the spirit is not given to the world but to the church, but it's given to the world through the church. So and God likes to work this way. He likes to bless other people through people. So he wants to bless the people around you through you. He wants to bless you through the people around you. And, you know, it's, it's an important uh, to, to be a part of a worshiping community, to be a part of the church, to remain connected, um, to not be in, um, just a me and Jesus only kind of Christian. And uh, I think these three chapters, uh, 12, 13, and 14, um, speak to that a lot. So we get uh, 1 Corinthians 12, picking up in verse 4 and going to verse 13. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of working, but it is, it is the same God who inspires them all and every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. 
All these are inspired by the one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. So, of course, their challenge is unity, and so Paul hits pretty hard on unity, um, reminding them that the main thing needs to be kept the main thing, which is Jesus. The Spirit unites us to Jesus, who unites us to the Father. Um, and all of these various manifestations and gifts, charisms, they all come from the same place. They all have the same purpose, to keep the main thing the main thing, to unite us to God and to be able to minister to those around us, to keep other people drawn in. And if it's something that's leading to division, then perhaps God needs to cut off the spigot. I don't think he ever gets around to explicitly saying that, but that seems to be kind of the undercurrent um, throughout the whole thing. Um, that, you know, look, this is a blessing. You need to treat it as a blessing. You're turning this around and using this as as a divisive thing. Um, and if, you know, if that's all you get out of it, then you're not worthy of it, and uh, perhaps God should just cut it off at the tap. Um, but this is something that you need, and you need to learn how to deal with it. You know, it's not good that God should just cut you off. Um, what's good is that you should learn how to handle this stuff, that you're, uh, that you're just not mature enough to, to, to handle correctly. So I'm going to uh, advise you and educate you and and help you mature in, in terms of how you handle these gifts. And so I think one thing that he does very deliberately, since speaking in tongues got kind of all the attention, is that he puts it at the end of the list. And um, so as to kind of downplay, like, look, there's many gifts of the Spirit, and that's just one of them. Um, and it's not even a, a big one. You know, it's something that, um, it's a hurdle that will be overcome in time, a very short time. So just going back to our reading from that sermon in Africa from the 6th century. You know, today the church speaks in every tongue. It doesn't need a miracle anymore. Um, but it will always need these other gifts like wisdom and knowledge and faith and uh, God's healing and so on. All the, I, th I think the central thematic verse is verse 11. All these are inspired by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So some of you may feel bad that Johnny got one gift and Susie got another one and I got another one. Um, and isn't that unfair? But remember, Paul says, God in his great wisdom, he's the one who decided to, get, to disperse it the way he wants. He's the one who decided who gets what. And uh, he gave you a particular gift so that you should share it with someone else. And if you're not doing your job sharing it, then that means the other person who's supposed to benefit from it is not getting that benefit. Before we go to the gospel, um, let's look at the sequence hymn. Uh, the sequence is, you know, the, in the minor propers of the missal, there are, um, you have the gradual and the Alleluia, or tract, and the offertory and communion. And then at, at some festivals you have a sequence hymn, which is more than just, uh, the others are usually just, you know, one or two psalm verses and that's it. But here you have a whole hymn that's composed for that occasion. There used to be a whole lot of sequences in the Middle Ages, and then they, they cut them down from like, you know, 90 to 10 or something. So I, f I forget exactly how many are, are left in the modern, um, or at least in the old Rome Missal. I don't know if they're in the Novus Ordo Missae or not. They're not in the prayer book, except sort of through the back door. So the, in, the, in the hymnal, you have these sequences. I think the 1940 hymnal um, gives you an indication of where they're supposed to go. Um, the... The, the 1982 hymnal might just have them in there and it doesn't tell you where you're supposed to plug them in. It's just, you know, this is a great hymn and, you know, you can use it anytime you want. 
But I think the 1940 tells you where, they're, where they belong. But this is um, one translation of the Veni Sancte Spiritus, the sequence for Pentecost. Come, thou Holy Spirit, come, and from thy celestial home shed a ray of light divine. Come, thou Father of the poor, come, thou source of all our store, come within our bosoms shine, sorry, come within our bosoms shrine, thou of comforters the best, thou the soul's delightful guest, sweet refreshments here below. In our labor rest most sweet, pleasant coolness in the heat, solace in the midst of woe. O most blessed light divine, shine within these hearts of thine, and our inmost being fill. Where thou art not, man hath naught, nothing good in deed or thought, nothing free from taint of ill. Heal our wounds, our strength renew, on our dryness pour thy dew, wash the stains of guilt away, bend the stubborn heart and will, melt the frozen, warm the chill, guide the steps that go astray. On thy faithful who adore and confess thee evermore, in thy sevenfold gifts descend, give them virtue's sure reward, give them thy salvation, Lord, Give them joys that never end. Amen. Alleluia. And I think the sequence, <clears throat> the sequences are uh, some of the most beautiful parts of the liturgy. Well, all those old hymns are really works of art. Um, but particularly, uh, you might say the sequence hymns represent kind of the cream of the crop, you know, the best of the best. And also there's the whole work of art in translating them because, you know, all these kind of nuances. And I, I don't know if the, if the Latin rhymes or not. But, of course, we're used to. Uh, yeah, it looks like some of them at least do. I'm not sure exactly the rhyming scheme. But in any case, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to take a poem in one language and make it a poem, not just a translation, but a work as a poem or a, a hymn or a song or something like that in another language. Because you gotta digest the ideas, translate the ideas and work it into something that rhymes and is beautiful and makes the same point. I and mean, you know, it's, it's almost a minor miracle in itself, I think. Well, let's look at the gospel. As we mentioned in the 79 prayer book, um, we have a, a, a new option of John chapter 20, uh, which is uh, Easter Sunday when Jesus appears and says, receive the Holy Spirit, who sins you forgive are forgiven, and so on. But the alternative uh, is the old gospel from John 14, and in the 2019 book, um, they take away John 20 and just leave us with the old one, John 14, verses 8 through 17. And remember, this is the Monday, Thursday, upper room scene. Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The works that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe in me, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So a lot of good meat in this uh, lesson. And uh, you can see why it was chosen for Pentecost. Well, let me see. Um, no, I think it's just um, 
17, the number didn't get typed on the page or something. It's, it's all there. Verse 17 ends with, I will be in you. And, of course, we see this, uh, we might say, prophesied or promised on Monday, Thursday, and then this very thing fulfilled at Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, let's kind of take these uh, bit by bit. Um, there's a lot of kind of frustration and confusion and worry, anxiety in the upper room that night. And there's several times where Jesus tries to console them and um, reassure their hearts and kind of uh, bolster and prepare them for the, the shock that is coming, the shock of his departure, of his arrest, his torture, his death. And um, he knows that that will place great strain on them and uh, tear them apart, um, pull them away from God. And of course, we know as things unfold that they all kind of scatter, you know, strike. He mentions that prophecy from the Old Testament, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And of course, they scattered. Uh, they came back, but they at least scattered for the moment. And they had um, a, a, a struggle, a trial. Um, Judas, of course, betrayed him, but Peter also denied him, you know, said three times, I don't even know that guy. Um, and so Jesus is um, several times coming back to this kind of uh, trying to console them, trying to embolden them, um, help them be courageous and uh, clear-headed. And so Philip, is, because he's talking about, I'm going to the Father, and uh, you're going to be without me, and... Um, you know the Father, and it's like, what are you talking about? I am, you know the way where I'm going? No, we don't know where you're going. How can we know how to get there? You know, I am the way. So that comes up in, in John 14, right in front of this. And then Philip says, um, you know, okay, you're going to the Father. Can, well, can you show us, you know? Um, then at least we'll, we'll have some satisfaction. Maybe we'll be a little bit more emboldened when we have to be without you. And um, Jesus is saying, no, no, I've taught you all this stuff a long time ago. This is nothing new. I've been with you so long, and yet, yet you don't understand. Um, the Father is in me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You, know, you don't have to say, show us the Father. The Father's right here. Um, we are so intimately connected that it literally makes no sense to talk about God the Father apart from God the Son, or God the Son apart from God the Father or either of them apart from God the Holy Spirit. Um, you're connected to one, you're connected to all, um, because all are God, even though they have uh, their own individuality, you might say. Uh, the person of the Father is not the same as the person of the Son. It's not just you know one guy with different masks that he changes out. And yet they're all God. They're all connected to the Godhead. They're all the same being, the same essence. So he says, believe me. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And if you don't believe me just because I say it, believe me because I do miracles. That authenticates what I say. Believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Um, and then, interestingly, he talks about, and you who believe in me, you'll also do these kinds of things. You will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will you, will you do, because I won't be here. You'll be doing, doing them or I would have, but I'm going to be up with the Father at the right hand, reigning, and you'll be down here carrying on my work. And so that's a big part of the upper room, um, as well as the overall scheme of the ministry of Jesus, is that he's calling and equipping people to carry on his ministry in his absence, on his behalf. And that especially comes to a head here. And so I think that's uh, also key to understanding this whole uh, if you ask me to do something, I'll do it, kind of thing. So when Jesus talks about that, he's not talking about, I'm going to be like Aladdin's lamp, where you know you rub the lamp and the genie comes out and you ask him to do something and we'll do it. It's not like that. You know, don't don't think of me in those terms. Um, rather, it's you're going to carry on without me, and you're going to have whatever assistance you need to do it. And, uh, you know, if you get in a situation where you need a miracle, you ask for it. Because I'm with you the, all, the whole time and all the way for everything that you need. Um, so don't ever hesitate. Because um, even though I'm leaving, 
I'm not really leaving. Just like even though I came down from heaven, I never left heaven. You know, There's that wonderful um, ascension sermon from Pope St. Leo the Great where he emphasizes that you know, it wasn't until after the ascension and, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that they came to kind of put all the puzzle pieces together and understand that with the incarnation, when Jesus came down from heaven, he never left heaven. And that means when he went back up to the Father, he never left us. You know, he, all, all the glories of Christ, all his miracles, power, presence, they have passed into the sacraments. They haven't disappeared from us. So I think that is the key to understanding verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so it's not, you know, if you rub the lamp, I'll be your genie. It's not that, you know. It is, I will be with you, work with you to do all the things that I've called you to do, to be my church, to carry on after me in my name, continuing my ministry in my place. Um, <clears throat> and of course, a big part of that will be the presence of the Holy Spirit, verse 16 and 17. Um, so how am I going to carry on with you? How am I going to empower you and uh, uh, fulfill your needs as you go along and continue my work? Well, I've been your parakletos. Now I'm going to have a substitute parakletos. You know, he's going to come take my place. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another parakletos, counselor, comforter, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And of course, we had talked about earlier the universal appeal and call of the gospel. And so it seems to kind of jar with what Jesus says here. But I think if we keep everything in, in its proper uh, understanding, it makes the meaning clear. So Jesus said, I'm going to give you the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. It neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. He dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus is not contradicting his great commission. You know, go to the, all the world, preach the gospel, teach them the commandments of Christ, and I'll be with you as you go. No, he's saying, of course the spirit wants to be poured out on all flesh. God wants the kingdom to consume all nations, tribes, and peoples, and so on. But remember, the Spirit is given to the church. But just like Paul says, you know, that gift is not for your own benefit. It's for someone else and their benefit. So this Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, it will receive through you, not apart from you. So the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, uh, because it neither sees him nor knows him, that's just like you know, people outside that don't recognize the works of God. When their hearts are not softened and prepared and ready for the gospel, it seems like nonsense. It seems like gibberish. Um, you know, the wisdom of God seems like foolishness. But for those whose hearts are prepared, who are ready to receive the message, then everything clicks and the spirit is passed on through the preaching and the uh, ministry of um, healing and uh, basically all the things that tie us into the presence and power of God in our lives. You know him. I think this is a good, good closing lines. It's a good place to, to cut um, between the different um, passages in the end of verse 16. I'm sorry, the end of verse 17. You know him. You know, this, this is a new thing you haven't experienced before, but don't worry. This is not a stranger. You've already been connected to him through me. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And that's another thing that, that that's kind of that, um, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know exactly what the right word is, but that, you know, just like Pope St. Leo the Great talked about, you know, when, when Christ came down from heaven, he didn't really leave heaven. When he goes back and leaves us to go return to heaven, he doesn't really leave us. Um, this kind of thing that with the gift of the Holy Spirit, there's not just sort of one gift of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that confuses people, you know. Like somebody may ask, well, when is the Holy Spirit given? It was given a lot of times. For some reason, we have this expectation that it's a one-time deal or that it's confined to one ceremony or to one event, um, prayer, or what have you. So you think about, well, the Holy Spirit has to be poured out preemptively to soften up the ground of your stony heart 
so the seeds of the gospel can come in and take root. He has to come preemptively to give it some water with his grace to help this thing sprout. He has to come in through the preaching of the word, word to the communication of his message through um, all kinds of incidental life circumstances and communications. You're talking with friends, you're talking with strangers, you're, you happen to see something on a billboard, you have to hear, hear something on television, you know, all of these things are mediating God's message to you in various ways. Uh, and then, of course, we, we focus on the big things like, well, at baptism, God pours out his spirit. That doesn't mean that that's limited to that. When we talk about the sacraments, what we're talking about is visible signs that show us for sure that something invisible is going on. It's not that the invisible things are limited to that. It's that this is a sure sign. That's what a sacrament is all about. So, of course, which sacrament is the Holy Spirit given in? All of them. <laughs> it's almost like it makes no sense to talk about a sacrament without the Holy Spirit because he's the one that pours out God's gifts, and that's what we're asking for God to give us in the sacraments is grace. And in a sense, when God gives us his grace, he's always giving us himself. Um, God's goodness is himself, in a sense. So we get a pouring out of the Holy Spirit at baptism. We get a pouring out of the Holy Spirit at confirmation. We get a pouring out of the Holy Spirit in reconciliation. We get a pouring out of the Holy Spirit in marriage and ordination and unction. Um, so there's not one single outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we get an outpouring of the Holy Spirit every time we ask. We wake up in the morning and say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and Lord, empower me for this day. So we'll leave it with that. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. No, generally, if, if you look, I, I don't know where it came along, but um, at some point there was like almost kind of like a fad in grammar about capitalizing references to the deity that are not basically names, you know, like Almighty God or something, um, but like just him. Um, and so I think, I think the New American Standard version is the only one that actually employs that um, capitalization. Um, otherwise, if you look in any other Bible, you never have, like, thy is never capitalized, um, except for that one translation that I'm aware of. There might be another one, but uh, I think that's it. And I don't know if that's a uniquely English thing. That's one of those things that, that comes and goes and varies a lot. Um, spelling, um, spelling really solidified around the arrival of the printing press. Because you see before that, if you look like in the early prayer books, you know, spelling is all over the place. Even by the time you get down to the American Revolution, you know, you find a lot of things are spelled funny and even be spelled differently in the same person writing the same document sometimes. But it really becomes standardized with print. Um, but even then, spelling varies, um, capitalization, punctuation, you kind of find trends like um, in, in the revision of the prayer books, I know especially, there used to be a lot more propensity toward putting in commas. Nowadays, there's a lot less um, interest in having commas. So there are a lot of, so you might have the same prayer where there's a whole lot of commas in the older version of it, and there's hardly any commas in the newer version of it. And that's just because things change. But the message stays the same.